everyone, my name is Grant, and you are listening to the new and improved History of the Modern Middle East podcast, Episode 1, The Sick Man and His Medicine. From the conquest of Constantinople to the death of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottomans seemed to be an unstoppable juggernaut, conquering Muslim and Christian lands alike. Even after the death of Suleiman, they remained a formidable force for centuries, permanently imprinting a fear of Muslim invaders on the collective consciousness of southeastern Europe. However, history would finally begin turning against the Ottomans in the late 17th century, first with the failure of the Second Siege of Vienna in 1683, and followed by the Treaty of Karlowitz in 1699, in which the Ottomans gave up most of their territory in Central Europe. From this point on, the Ottomans would go through a long decline, with chunks of territory being taken from them left and right. A century later, the Ottomans would attempt to stave off their destruction through reforms. However, these reforms would not be welcomed with open arms, at least not by everyone. Older institutions liked the system as it was, it did not appreciate anybody rocking the boat. But in 1789, while France was breaking out into revolution, Selim III would ascend to the Ottoman throne and pursue these desperately needed reforms. The new sultan came to power during a period of war. Despite ill health, Selim's predecessor, Abdul Hamid I, would declare war on the Russians, who had been encroaching on Ottoman territory. Even with aid from the French, the Ottoman army was not prepared for this fight. And when Abdul Hamid I died in 1789, Selim would be forced to carry on the war for another three years. After this defeat, the Sultan knew that changes were needed to keep up with the Europeans. The first reforms to attract his attention were in the military. When his armies were defeated by Catherine the Great of Russia, it was determined that the failure was due to inferior Ottoman weaponry and tactics. This was a significant change from the past, when losses were usually attributed to losing God's favor. The reform at the top of most people's list was the institution of the Janissaries. Many of these suggested reforms, however, were portrayed in a conservative light, portraying the changes as restoring a previous point of non-corrupt past rather than a whole new system. The Janissaries had been built on recruiting young Christians who had been converted to Islam, but over time this gradually changed, resulting in Muslim men being recruited instead. Instead of a professionally trained standing army, the Janissaries had become more of an unreliable militia. The reforms officially ended the nearly dead practice of recruiting newly converted Christian children, and was replaced with recruiting only Muslim-born children. They also stuck to recruiting peasants and tribal people from around Constantinople and within Anatolia. These new Janissaries, trained by French officers, were referred to as the New Order, and would go on to serve the Sultan well in upcoming conflicts. The Ottomans and the French had fairly good relations with each other since the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. Selim III was considered by many to be a Francophile, and when revolution broke out in France in 1789, he was quite concerned. Despite his concern for his ally, the Sultan was willing to take advantage of the Europeans' preoccupation with the political situation in France in order to solidify his own. Which is pretty funny because revolutionary France was hoping to use the Ottomans to distract the Austrians and Russians from intervening. These confusing relations would be stretched to their limits when the little corporal from Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte, would invade the caliphate. He invaded Egypt in 1798 and defeated the local Mamluk rulers at the Battle of the Pyramids, who had been governing Egypt on behalf of the Ottoman Empire for centuries. The Ottoman governors fled to the southern highlands of Upper Egypt, leaving Napoleon in control of the northern lowlands, where he set up his own governing institutions and began work on infrastructure projects. Napoleon made claims of being friendly with Islam and even toyed with the idea of converting. This is also when the European obsession with Egypt began. Napoleon had brought a bunch of scientists and other academics to study and grab anything not nailed down back to France. Things seemed to be going well until Napoleon's fleet was destroyed by Admiral Nelson in August of 1798. Sultan Selim III had formed an alliance with the Russians and British in order to eject the French from his territory. Running out of options in Egypt, Napoleon went north and eastward up into Syria, where he would be turned back by Turkish forces. Things were not going well, so he used the excuse of problems at home in Paris to escape with a few of his men and return to France, where he would subsequently take over the government in a coup in August of 1799. The forces he left behind in Egypt would manage to hold on for two more years while little to no support from Napoleon came. Peace was made between the two powers in 1802 with the Treaty of Amiens, after which Selim III was eager to re-establish positive relations. 
The Ottomans had granted recognition to France's revolutionary government, but were hesitant to recognize Napoleon as emperor when he crowned himself in 1804. However, the Sultan did eventually give recognition in 1806, but only after both the Russians and Austrians suffered major defeats against Napoleon. During these conflicts, France gained control of territory along the Adriatic Sea, which resulted in the French bordering the Ottoman Empire. Between the shift in borders and passive-aggressive threats from Napoleon, the Sultan agreed to an alliance with France, but by this point, the Sultan's days were numbered. The Sultan's attempts at reforming the Janissaries through the new order was not popular with the old order, which had not yet been replaced. He tried to deprive the Janissaries of new members by heavily enlisting new troops from the Balkans. This put the Janissaries into conflict with local divisions of the new order, and in some instances led to armed clashes between the two. The Janissary problem had also been getting worse, actually causing an anti-Janissary revolt in Serbia in 1804, which convinced Selim that he needed to continue the reforms. But in 1806, a division of the new order went into the city of Adirne, outside of Constantinople, to intimidate the old order Janissaries, which was not received well by them or the local populace, who refused to provide provisions to the new order troops when commanded by the local authorities. A very bad sign came that Friday when the Sultan was omitted from Friday prayers across mosques in the region. Local magistrates attempted to impose the new order reforms on the old Janissaries, but this resulted in bloodshed on both sides. Wanting to avoid more internal conflict, Selim III ordered his new order troops to proceed no further in implementing the new order on the Janissaries of the Balkans. The reforms made to the Janissaries would come to a boiling point twice during Selim's reign. The first was in 1797, just before Napoleon invaded. It was the invasion by an outside power that managed to tamper down that rebellion, but it happened again in 1807, and unlike the last time, there was no outside invasion at which to redirect the Janissaries. Instead, they rose up against Selim, removed him from the throne, and put his cousin Mustafa IV on it, who promised to leave the Janissaries alone and end the attempted reforms. In 1808, there was an attempted coup to put Selim III back on the throne by an Ottoman military commander, Bey Rakhdar Mustafa. However, when he arrived at Constantinople, it was discovered that Selim had been assassinated. However, this was only a minor setback. This military commander had brought with him 40,000 troops and plenty of righteous indignation. So he did what anyone in his position would do. Overthrow the government, kill the sitting sultan, and place Mustafa's half-brother, Mahmud II, on the throne. Mahmud II has a bad reputation among Western historians due to the Ottoman Empire's declining status during his reign, but I think he deserves more sympathy than regularly given. Since the reign of Bayezid II, the Janissaries had been a potential threat to the Sultan, and the overthrow of the reformist Selim III would be the last straw. Mahmud II knew that the Janissaries couldn't be trusted, and that they would stand in the way of any reform efforts. So, before he could continue the policies of Selim III, he would need to do away with the Janissaries, and eventually, he would. In 1826, one of the arguably most important reforms in the empire occurred. Since the beginning of his reign, Mahmud II had been building up the palace guards with soldiers loyal to the Sultan. The ultimate goal of this force was to use them on the Janissaries when the time was right. When the Sultan was certain that both his subjects and the religious institutions were on his side, he ordered an attack on the barracks and other strongholds of the Janissaries. However, they were not his only target. On top of abolishing the Janissaries, he also banned all the groups that had supported them and gave their property to his supporters. The attack is often referred to as the auspicious event within Ottoman historiography, and it was received as a mostly positive event. With what seemed to be the biggest hurdle to reform out of the way, Mahmud II could spend the remainder of his reign reforming the rest of the empire. Schools were expanded, with a particular emphasis on the state taking over education from religious institutions. They wanted to teach medicine and engineering, but these required importing European experts in this field, along with textbooks, all of which were in European languages. So this required that the schools had to teach European languages before they could get more technical training. And this is still pretty common in the Middle East today, with more technical skills requiring an understanding of English. At this time, there were also schools being founded by foreigners in the Ottoman Empire. The most successful and least scrutinized of these came from the Americans. In the 19th century, most Americans saw themselves as different and separate from their European ancestors. And this was a perspective shared by Muslims in the Middle East. Unlike the Europeans, the Americans had never invaded Muslim territory. 
unless you include some of the Barbary Wars. American missionaries were the only ones allowed in the Ottoman Empire due to the United States' lack of an official church. Most European countries at the time still had national churches, be it the Anglican Church in England, the Catholic Church in France and Spain, or the Orthodox Church in Russia. Because of the ties between the clergy and European governments, there was always the suspicion among the Ottomans that the European missionaries were serving as agents of their governments, looking to organize Christians and other religious minorities in the empire into a fifth column. Well, because there was none of this fraternizing between the U.S. government and American missionaries, there wasn't this same fear of Americans organizing an uprising against the Ottomans. The Ottomans had another problem with European missionaries, and that was their focus on converting Muslims to Christianity. In contrast to that, American missionaries focused on converting Jews and non-Protestant Christians to Protestant Christianity. With Protestants being such a small minority in that part of the world, and the nearest Protestant great power being Great Britain, the Turks were not as concerned with the activities of the American missionaries. These American missionaries would go on to found numerous universities in the Ottoman Empire, many of which are still standing today. These universities would be responsible for introducing generations of Ottoman Muslims to Western ideas such as liberalism and nationalism, which would serve as a kind of time bomb in the empire that would go off during the Great War. But before we get there, we need to get back to the narrative. The 1830s would see the first of many territorial losses in the 19th century, with France occupying Algeria in 1830 and Greece gaining independence in 1832. Mehmet Ali of Egypt would invade and occupy Syria in 1831, forcing the Sultan to seek help in retaining his territorial integrity. To do this, they would turn to a very unlikely ally, Russia. In the 1833 hunkar Eskelisi Treaty, Russia agreed to defend the Ottoman Empire from outside powers. This was a shock to Europe and a concern to Britain, who feared that this agreement granted Russians the right to cross through the Dardanelles and thereby have a presence in the Mediterranean. These fears would be assuaged a bit when the Ottomans signed a commercial treaty with the British in 1838, which lowered tariffs on British manufactured goods in the empire, which subsequently gave the British an incentive to keep the Ottoman Empire alive, which would come in handy for the Ottomans in the not-too-distant future. Mahmud II would die in 1839, but his reforms would not die with him. His successor, Abdul Majid, would reign during the greatest period of reform, the Tanzimat, or the Reordering. Upon the advice of his foreign minister, the new sultan issued the noble rescript of the Rose Chamber. In this decree, he promised to create new institutions to protect the basic rights of Christians, as well as assess and levy taxes and train soldiers. This took the form of a state-run school system to train government officials, reorganize provincial governments, build infrastructure projects, and create a modernized financial system. Not all reacted positively to these reforms, though. Old nobles in the empire lost their livelihoods, which had been based on the old corrupt system. Christians in the Balkans did not like the plan for the empire's government to be centralized, as it would eliminate the autonomy that they had acquired up to that point. Some of these groups now sought independence, which was attempted during the revolutions of 1848. The Russians would use their right to intervene in the Danubian principalities to put down these revolts, but it would end up serving the Russian goal of expanding their influence in the Balkans. The French would also claim the right to intervene in the Ottoman Empire in 1852 after the keys of the Church of the Nativity were given to the Catholics, whom the French claimed the right to protect. The Crimean War would be caused in large part by the overlapping claims of the Russians, British, and French to intervene in the Ottoman Empire. In the months before the start of the Crimean War, the Russian Tsar, Nicholas I, discussed with the British ambassador his plan to partition the Ottoman Empire between the two powers. Russia would claim the Ottoman territories in the Balkans, with the British receiving Crete in Egypt. The British were silent on whether or not they approved, which the Russians assumed meant that they were on board. When the Ottomans refused the Russian ultimatum to revoke France's right to protect the holy sites, Tsar Nicholas declared war and invaded Moldova, which is part of modern-day Romania. However, things would not go so well for the Russians. The French and British, also having rights and interests in the Ottoman Empire, decided to intervene. The Austrians would also intervene, pushing Russian troops out of the Danubian principalities after the Ottomans agreed to hand sovereignty over of those territories during the duration of the war. This resulted in most of the fighting taking place in the Crimean Peninsula. The war would end in 1856 with the Treaty of Paris, which turned the Black Sea into a demilitarized zone, but more importantly for Britain and France, 
It was used as leverage to get more concessions out of the Ottoman Empire. The 1839 proclamation said that it would work towards establishing equality in the empire, but it was vague on the particulars, with France and Britain taking a particular interest in the fate of non-Muslims. In order to satiate the French and British concerns, the Ottomans would release the Hati Humayan, an imperial edict that clarified the protections for non-Muslims. It would declare non-Muslims in the empire to be full citizens and allow them to serve on councils of state. These reforms would not just be limited to political and legal rights, but would also involve economics of the empire as well. The reform which had the biggest immediate impact was that of land ownership. Up until this point, all land in the Ottoman Empire was owned by the state. Individuals and families could use the land if they paid a special tax. These land reforms would replace the system of state ownership of land with individual ownership of land along European lines. The old system had been part of the corrupt elements of the Ottoman Empire, and unfortunately the new system did not have the hoped for results. Many of the new rules were circumvented, and the old tax farming class was replaced by a new landholding class. Instead of having a large number of small landholders that could innovate and invest in new technology like in Europe or America, they instead had a large number of sharecroppers. This, however, was usually achieved through bribery from large landholders. And on top of this, foreigners were finally allowed to own land in the Ottoman Empire starting in 1867. One minor success from the plan allowed Muslim refugees from the Russian Empire to settle in uncultivated lands in Anatolia. This would pay dividends later during World War I, when descendants of those refugees fought hard against the Allies to defend their lands, thereby preventing much of modern-day Turkey from falling into the hands of Greece. The people weren't necessarily worse off than before. They had access to European manufactured goods at a much cheaper price than their domestic manufacturers could make them. They also gained access to railroads, steamships, telegraphs, and modern schooling. Of course, the free trade policies pushed on the Ottomans did weaken fledgling industries in the empire, but there was little the Ottoman Empire could do at this point to catch up to the Europeans in terms of economic and military strength, and much of the efforts to do so put the empire in debt. The Ottomans had used deficit spending to finance infrastructure projects, which did not increase revenue enough to pay for them. In 1875, the Ottoman government declared that they only had enough cash to service half of their debt. The remainder would be paid for with government bonds. This was the equivalent of paying one credit card bill by taking out a cash loan from another. The empire was declaring bankruptcy, which would be used by the Europeans to leverage more reforms out of them. Until his death in 1861, Sultan Abdul Majid had been concentrating more and more power into his own hands in his efforts to centralize the government of the empire. Greater centralized government was usually a preferred reform by Europeans, but they wanted this centralized power to be practiced by constitutional and representative bodies. Ideas of political representation had been growing among young Ottoman elites who had received Western educations, and were thus inundated with ideas of political liberalism. Reformers were no longer a small faction of the elite, but the majority. These elites formed a secret organization called the Young Ottomans, who would pursue political reform within the empire. Abdul Majid's successor, Abdul Aziz, would initially declare himself a reformer, but would later prove himself to be otherwise. By 1871, the reform-minded pashas were gone, and the inspiration for Ottoman reform since the reign of Selim III was defeated by a newly unified Germany, which resulted in a lack of political will for reform within the Ottoman government. The lack of will was exacerbated by the global economic depression in 1873, which contributed to the Ottomans declaring bankruptcy in 1875. The Russians were threatening war in the Balkans, and alongside political and economic degradation of the Ottoman state, they also faced a series of territorial humiliations, with France occupying Lebanon in 1861 and being forced to grant autonomy to Serbia and Crete, and brutally putting down a revolt in Bulgaria, which turned Western opinions against the Turks. These issues would come to a boiling point in 1876, when Sultan Abdul Aziz dismissed a series of Grand Viziers, one of whom was Midhat Pasha, who was secretly a constitutionalist and therefore an ally of the young Ottomans. A mass demonstration of students in Istanbul demanded the reinstatement of Midhat Pasha, and the Sultan complied. This, however, would spark a coup. Midhat convinced his fellow ministers of the necessity of a constitutional change, 
and persuaded the chief mufti to issue a fatwa announcing the removal of Abdul Aziz from the Sultancy. The army and the navy supported the moves of Midhat, and to secure his own safety and avoid civil war, Abdul Aziz didn't resist. His nephew would succeed him, being crowned Sultan Murad V, but not for long. After only three months on the throne, Murad abdicated in favor of his younger brother, Abdul Hamid II. He had never expected to ascend the throne, which led him to living a more pious and private life. He was hardworking and had learned about economics and finance during his time managing a farm and investing in Istanbul Stock Exchange. He was not as much of a reformer as Abdul Majid, but he was dedicated to preserving the sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire. A constitution was established after the deposition of Abdul Aziz, after which Abdul Hamid would dismiss Midhat Pasha and send him into exile. Midhat Pasha would spend the rest of his life on a merry-go-round of being allowed to return in banishment until he was murdered in a prison in Arabia. Despite his preference for despotism, Abdul Hamid would allow the new Ottoman parliament to meet in March of 1877. But he was concerned about the body's penchant for independence. The parliament called for the sultan's ministers to be answerable to itself, which led the sultan to dismissing the assembly after only three months, just to call it back into session six months later. The first constitutional period of the Ottoman Empire had the unfortunate timing of beginning during an international crisis. In 1876, the Russians had been supporting rebels in the Balkans in an effort to force the Sultan to grant Russia the right to protect Christians within the Ottoman Empire. The British called for a conference in Constantinople in order to de-escalate the tensions and avoid war. But it would be ineffectual with Russian troops occupying Ottoman Armenia and secretly negotiating a division of the Balkans with Austria in exchange for their neutrality. The conflict resulted in the humiliating Treaty of San Stefano in 1878, which forced the creation of two independent Slavic states, Bulgaria and Montenegro. This left the British politically confounded. On one hand, they had condemned the oppression of Christians by the barbaric Turks, and on the other, they had a strategic interest in maintaining the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire, mostly in preventing the expansion of the Russian Empire. The Treaty of San Stefano would later be annulled by the Congress of Berlin later that year, which redrew the map of the Balkans to create independent states of Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro. Bulgaria would be split into two provinces, one which was governed by an Ottoman Christian prince and the other an independent Turkish government. A secret agreement had been made between the Ottomans and the British two months earlier in exchange for the British support of the Ottomans at the Berlin Conference. This secret agreement allowed the British to occupy the island of Crete. This agreement made France none too happy, and so the British made another secret deal with them, saying that they could intervene in Tunisia as they saw fit. The French took them up on this offer three years later when they occupied Tunisia in 1881, declaring it a protectorate. This made it hard for the French to complain when the British would do the same to Egypt a year later. Once the crisis was over, Abdul Hamid II felt strong enough to dissolve the parliament and suspend the constitution. It would remain suspended for the next 30 years. The Sultan was most concerned with preserving his own station. He reassumed powers that had been devolved to ministers and had officials reporting directly to him. He built up a network of spies around the empire who informed him of when certain individuals were becoming too powerful for his liking. He instructed these agents to foster local rivalries with any potential challengers to ensure that they could not challenge him. The reforms he did keep were those he felt increased the strength of the Ottoman Empire. This meant anything having to do with the military. He saw his support for primary and secondary schools as tantamount to supporting a stronger military and the state. He tightened the already tight controls over the media, with every publication being censored. He was especially dedicated to censoring any story about violence towards a head of state, out of fear it would inspire assassination attempts against him. One example of this was when the king and queen of Serbia were assassinated in 1903. Ottoman newspapers reported the cause of death for this assassination as indigestion. But these restrictions did not get rid of dissent. All it did was push it underground and allow it to radicalize and fester. The Sultan was not just concerned with retaining power against internal foes, but also with foreign encroachments within the empire's borders. Over the last century, the Ottomans had made many capitulations to the Europeans in exchange for economic growth, 
going so far as to allow non-Muslim subjects in the empire to be tried in foreign-run courts for crimes committed in the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan attempted to undo this with the creation of a Ministry of Justice that would control all non-religious courts. But this ended up failing, with any attempt at writing new laws abandoned by the end of the 1880s. The economics of the empire were not in very good shape either. Having declared bankruptcy in the 1870s, a Council of Public Debt was set up in 1881 in order to satisfy holders of Ottoman bonds and ensure them that the debt would be paid. The European powers wanted to improve the Ottoman economy as well, considering it was the only way to get their money back. But the Ottomans had not yet gotten past their debilitating corruptions or their taxation on the movement of goods internally within the empire. Ultimately, the local manufacturing industry could not compete with the price and quality of foreign-made goods. Although they failed in improving industrial output, they were successful in growing agricultural output. But this had little to do with the policies of the government. Increased industrialization in Europe created a demand for more raw materials, which the Ottomans had in abundance. The Ottomans increased their exports of grains thanks to the repeal of the Corn Laws in Britain, they would also benefit from the American Civil War, which impacted the international cotton market by drastically reducing the amount of cotton produced by the American South. Both Egypt and the Ottoman Empire took advantage of this shortage by exporting more cotton to Europe. And luckily for the Ottomans, this boom wasn't completely reversed after the war, but it would still not be enough to raise them up to resist the Europeans. They would need an ally to do that. In the last years of the Ottoman Empire, Germany was the closest ally that the Turks could get. Having defeated the Ottomans' previous European ally, France, in 1871, the newly unified Germany proved to be the most useful bulwark against the eyes of Europe. Russia, France, and Britain all had imperial ambitions in the Near East, while Germany had none. On top of a lack of interest in Ottoman territory, they also had incentive to keep the other Europeans from carving it up for themselves. This relationship only grew stronger upon the ascension of Kaiser Wilhelm II, who advanced a policy of German interests in the East, and because Germany didn't have the same liberal flavor as France and Britain, Abdul Hamid II trusted them more. The Kaiser toured the Ottoman Empire numerous times, while German engineers and officers worked with the Ottoman authorities to build up the infrastructure and military. They built railway lines from Anatolia to Baghdad, through Basra to the Persian Gulf. In 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm II visited Jerusalem, entering the city dressed as a crusader knight. And in Damascus, he gave a speech at the tomb of Saladin, where he proclaimed Germany's disinterest in Ottoman territory. The foundation of an Ottoman-German alliance was laid, and with it the seeds of destruction for both empires. On the eve of the 20th century, the Ottomans are dealing with competing forces of internal convulsion and foreign pressure. A century of stop and start reforms has left the empire a powder keg about to blow. The reforms have not been enough to satisfy modernists, and the stops have not been enough to satisfy the reactionaries. And so, next time on the history of the modern Middle East, we will explore the last decade of the empire before the unstoppable downward spiral takes the Middle East from a relatively peaceful place to the land of oil, fire, and radicalism we know today. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can reach me on Twitter at Grant G. Hurst, or you can send an email to History of the Modern Middle East at gmail.com. If you're interested in the sources I used for this episode, you can check the show notes at historyofthemodernmiddleeast.com for this episode. Thanks for listening.